So, meine Damen und Herren, ihr Lufthansa Flug 440 nach Houston, Gopas, Herr Mittler, Herr Nestor, Heinz Partner, ist jetzt einsteigerbereit. A standard terminal at a standard European airport. International departures area. 45 minutes remain until it's time for boarding the plane. Passengers have already checked in and are waiting to take their seats. They have an 11-hour flight ahead from Germany to the USA. The terminal is boring, it's cloudy outside, the airline representative is calm and going through the motions. Nothing betrays the enormous work currently taking place inside the largest passenger airliner in the world. And of course, none of the passengers are pausing to think about the titanic work performed to build this monster. And most importantly, to teach it how to fly. Definitiv nicht geht, haben die Männer mir eben gerade gesagt, die kriegen das jetzt nicht hin. The world's largest passenger aircraft and the program Monster Anatomy. You'd better fasten your seatbelt. This plane had to complete a long journey before arriving at Frankfurt Airport. And what's more strange as it may sound, this monster began traveling before it was even born. After all, each A330 consists of 6.5 million parts and components produced by one and a half thousand companies in 30 countries all over the world. The A380 is the largest passenger aircraft in the history of world aviation. It's manufactured by Airbus. The maximum capacity is 853 passengers, the length of the aligner is almost 73 meters, the wingspan is almost 80, the height is 24 meters. In fact, this is the height of a nine-story building. And the area of the two passenger decks totals 550 square meters, which is larger than the area of a football field. The A380 is such a complex and high-tech machine that none of the EU countries were able to take on this project alone. As a result, this giant aircraft came into creation thanks to its four parents, Germany, France, Spain, and Great Britain. The wings are made in the Foggy Albion, the tail is made in the homeland of Columbus, and the final assembly is done in France. But the most complex and crucial stage, the production of the fuselage sections, was entrusted to the meticulous and scrupulous Germans. Welcome on board the A380. Please show me what you have here. Yes. So if you want to follow me, we'll mm -hmm. see some... Well, do you see how much space there is? I mean, name another plane where you can encounter something like this. It's hard to believe that this is a plane. It feels like the living room of some reception hall. If you look at the cabin, this is the widest cabin in the sky. The special showroom displays a variety of A380 cabin layouts, from economy to business, first and premium class. Cabins like these are considered the highest of chic. They're called suites here. Essentially, it's a small five-star hotel room with a bed, an armchair, and of course, a TV and a small table. If you wish, you can even invite someone into such a cabin. It won't be crowded, but that said, you won't achieve complete privacy here as the side wall of a suite is only 1.8 meters high. According to aviation rules, stewards must see what is happening to a passenger at all times. So now, as you can see, we're entering the business class cabin, and here we have beautiful armchairs that actually convert into beds. Ooh. Everything moves, everything goes lower. I feel like I'm in a spaceship in some kind of sci-fi movie. <laughs> yeah. Sweet. There's even a TV. I mean, well, yeah, I'm in the future. It'd be nice to fly in these conditions somewhere from, I don't know, Moscow to Vladivostok. Not like I usually do. Comfort is perhaps the main trump card of the A380 developers. This is where the main emphasis is placed. Airbus is especially proud that this monster has the quietest cabin in the history of world aviation. 
Standing at the top deck bar and listening to music, it's easy to forget that you're even on an airplane. What's more, in-flight comfort is created not only for the passengers, but also for the crew. Another of the numerous features on the A380 is that it's claimed to actually have the largest and most comfortable crew rest cabin. But it appears to be big only by French standards, as I have to tilt my head a little. Nevertheless, it's got everything you need to relax. A bed, a TV, even a phone. Basically, it's pound for pound a small hotel room. But so that the crew members don't forget that they are still at work, the affectionate French attached the sign one person only near each capsule, just in case. In fact, the dimensions of this compartment are standard for any A380. Everything else can be changed. Now the most popular layout is the passenger compartment divided into three different classes. In this case, that means the aircraft has 525 seats. But you can also order a setup where there will be only economy class throughout the plane. Then the number of seats can be increased to 853. However, for some reason, no one has ordered that one yet. Still, the interior and the seat are, as they say, add-ons. The interior of the A380 will again be fitted in Germany, and the plane must fly there itself. To do that, after assembly on the slipway, it will have to pass an extremely tough exam. The fuselage of this giant consists of three huge sections, a nose, tail, and middle. It is also called the center section. All of them are manufactured here in a huge special hangar near Hamburg. A lot of time and thought went into selecting the location. On the one hand, there had to be an airport nearby as many components arrived here by plane. On the other hand, the presence of a navigable river was necessary in order to... Mind you, why a future flying monster needs a river, you will find out a little later. As a result, the plan was built on the banks of the Elba. The fact that it flows into the Atlantic Ocean played a decisive role in the choice of location. To accommodate more passengers on the plane, Airbus designers decided to make it a full two-story plane and not with a hump like on Boeing's, for example. This is where the 8 in A380 comes from. This figure somewhat resembles the cross-section of an airplane fuselage. Also in the east, it is believed that the number 8 brings good luck. And the first customer of these giants here was actually Singapore Airlines. The fuselage sections are assembled on huge slipways. They're somewhat reminiscent of scaffolding. The parts of the casing are thoroughly inspected, checked, then technological hooks are screwed onto them, which are then used so a crane can lift the parts. Afterwards, individual segments are assembled on the slipway to form a finished part of the fuselage. It all looks like a huge 3D puzzle. In just one day, the body of the future section appears from a dozen pieces. There are six assembly slipways in this hangar. The section simply transfers from one to another, gradually drowning more and more in wires, cables, lines, hoses, pipes, tubes, air supply systems, and internal lining. Basically, what you have here is a giant conveyor belt where a section spends several days at each stage. The aircraft body consists of only 75% aluminum. The remaining 25 are special composite materials. For example, this part is the plane's tail, made of especially durable fiberglass. Based on its characteristics, this material is pretty much the same as aluminum, but significantly lighter. Theoretically, it would be possible to make an entire plane out of this, but it would simply be very expensive. Besides, according to developers, the trickiest part in creating the aircraft is the issue of reducing its weight. This monster is so huge that its own projected weight could have prevented it from flying. This problem was solved not only thanks to fiberglass, but also augmented aluminum alloy. As a result, only 40% of the center section consists of volatile metals, while the rest is made up of composites. After the body of the sections is ready, it is carefully wrapped from the inside in a coat, 
I guess. It's a special heat insulating material due to its ability to retain heat. A thin layer of such fiber replaces a 10 centimeter layer of glass wool. But that's not even the main thing. In the event of a fire, God forbid, of course, this material is capable of holding temperatures of several thousand degrees for 90 seconds. Every square centimeter of this aircraft has been planned down to the tiniest detail. The thermal insulation material, for example, arrives in segmented pieces based on special templates. Even if the worker wanted to, he wouldn't be able to attach the wrong segment to the casing. It simply wouldn't slot in with the others. So this shirt will fit our monster like a glove. We all know, of course, that an airplane is a tough nut to crack, but I'm afraid we can't even imagine how complicated it is. For instance, when we enter the passenger deck, we can't even begin to presume what's under our feet. Now you have a unique opportunity to see this. Hundreds of wires, a thousand contacts, but you know what? This is just for starters. You should see what's happening under the ceiling. One A380 has 530 kilometers of wires. In the cockpit alone, there are about 10,000 of them and about 40,000 of their various connections. They are everywhere. They weave through the entire plane from nose to tail. Every second, huge amounts of information and hundreds of volts must be transmitted through them. These are like the nerve endings of our monster. By the way, main connection lines are duplicated three times. If a short circuit occurs in the main line, the backup will cover it. Should the second fail, the third will take its place. And that means that mainline wires have to be fitted four times over. All this in conditions of extremely limited space and severe time pressure. To get to any given connection, workers sometimes have to use rather exotic tools. A dentist's mirror, for example. But to be fair, this version is a little bigger. Fitting the electrics is the most difficult stage of equipping this section, which is why it spends the most time on this slipway. The huge structure is then transported further. At this stage, air supply and air conditioning systems are installed inside the section. By the way, none of the air ducts are metal, aluminum, or even tin. They're made of fiberglass. And again, because it is lighter. In fact, all the air in the A380, and that's one and a half thousand cubic meters, is completely exchanged every three minutes. As a result, absolutely everything is installed in the sections except the inner lining. After all systems have been checked tenfold, along with wires, pipe connections have been tested, only after this are the ends of the huge sections covered with fabric and the huge components of the aircraft rolled out of the hangar onto the pier. And here it becomes clear why the flying monster needs a river. Naturally, the logistics for transporting the components of an A380 are crazy. Here in Hamburg, several sections are loaded onto this specially built barge, after which it goes along the Elba to the Atlantic, to the UK, where two aircraft wings will be overloaded. Now at that point, this ship turns around and heads back to France. The A380 is a monster that doesn't just fly, it's a monster that unites. The sections of the aircraft are so huge that there's no other way to deliver them to their place of final assembly other than by water. Huge fragments are loaded onto one of three River C-class ships specially commissioned for the A380. And so that onlookers have no doubt about their grand purpose, the side of each barge proudly boasts this inscription. Once again, due to the huge size and the high fragility of the sections, they did not even try to build a crane in this transshipment port. The parts of the future aircraft move inside the ship themselves, and to do this, the stern of the ship simply tilts down and the pier sags towards it, like a huge elevator.
A huge number of different devices, tools, and machines were created specifically for the construction of the A380. One of them is this tow truck. Its main unique feature is that all of its 48 wheels, by the way, can rotate 90 degrees. And that means, if needed, this platform with a load capacity of tens of tons can actually move sideways. And this is a very important quality in conditions of limited loading dock space. The platform drives under the section, lifts it, carries it into the hold, and then places it there and moves out again. operation takes about 15 minutes. And the most amazing thing is that the driver of this miracle car, there he is. Yeah, he doesn't even sit in the cabin, but walks next to it and looks to see if everything is okay. A huge trolley that he controls using a remote. In just a few days, this huge ship with parts of the fuselage inside will be in Bordeaux, France. At the seaport of Poyac, the sections will be loaded onto one of two river barges and sent up the Garonne. 100 kilometers of canals, sluices, and overhanging ancient bridges. In some places, the distance from the top of the section to the bridge truss is only 20 centimeters. However, never in the entire history of the A380 have any emergency incidents occurred with the fuselage and sections on the road. In the river port of Langon, the aircraft parts are again loaded onto road trains, and now they have to travel another 240 kilometers on the road to Toulouse, to the final assembly site. <laughs> the path of our monster's components runs through small French towns. To minimize inconvenience to residents, the convoy of six huge trailers and 30 escort vehicles moves only at night. During the day, this huge convoy, stretching several kilometers, rests in specially constructed parking lots. But once darkness descends, everything here begins to move again. Okay, we'll do it as we always do. The weather conditions today are good. The road is dry. Visibility is excellent. Arno, you're going to go in the front. Don't forget to remove the barriers in the cities. Speed is 15 to 25 kilometers per hour. No more. Good luck, everybody. Each of them knows what and when to do something like the back of their hand. The drivers never change their order in the convoy. The trailer with the right wing of the plane always comes first. That's just how it came about. When the A380 parts were transported for the first time, that was the order. And since then, there have been no incidents, and they decided to leave this order for luck. I transport different loads, but I consider this task the most interesting, albeit the most difficult, as all of it requires constant focus. On top of that, I'm first driver, but my two navigator operators always help me. One goes in the front, the other behind. They constantly radio in, telling me to drive a little to the right or a little to the left, but that's mostly necessary in cities, of course. The route along which the Airbus night convoy moves is closed off. A police car, technical service vehicles, and a motorcycle escort are up ahead. In France, they don't even escort the president's limousine. About 40 minutes before the convoy passes through any city, the support group walking in front prepares the path, removing any interfering cars and sweeping the road clear. There shouldn't be any bumps whatsoever. Then they unscrew the posts separating the roadway from the pavement, and all this is done surprisingly calmly and, of course, politely. All right, and there we go. Good evening, sir. Good evening. While passing through the city, the convoy speed is reduced to five to seven kilometers per hour. Huge sections of the fuselage literally hang over old French houses. 
After all, they are at least twice as tall as them. And in some places, the distance from the load to the wall is reduced to several centimeters. Here, nothing less than pinpoint precision is required from the heavy-duty truck drivers. A glittering line of trucks driving through narrow French streets. The giant components of the A380 here in Provence have long been an attraction of sorts. Despite the late hour, of course, many local residents come out to see the spectacle. For them, this night convoy is like an Airbus carnival. Always at the same time, somewhere around 2 a.m., the convoy enters the territory of the A380 assembly site near Toulouse. Come dawn, here the main stage of creating this giant aircraft will begin, joining the sections. It's like Toulouse was specially constructed to be the A380 production site. Firstly, it is a very romantic city. It is also called the Pink City because of the peculiar color of the bricks. Secondly, it was here that Antoine de Saint-Exupéry, the famous writer who made millions of people around the world look at the sky differently, was born. Just like our monster, the A380. While the fuselage sections that arrived here at night are being unloaded near the main Airbus assembly hangar, one of the world's largest cargo planes is landing on the tarmac of the local Blagnac airport. It's branded the Beluga. A name it received due to its external resemblance to the enormous deep sea inhabitant. The powerful transporter has brought the tail of the A380 from Spain for assembly. Most transport aircraft load and unload from the tail, but this plane is unique in every single way. Its nose ramp folds up, and the part of the future monster simply slides out onto a special platform, which slowly and carefully approaches the plane. Only one component of the A380 struggles to fit into the belly of this huge whale, this beluga, the tail. And that's despite the fact that the diameter of the cargo compartment is seven and a half meters and the volume is one and a half thousand cubic meters. This fish has a large stomach. Usually the most difficult thing is to properly secure the cargo inside the hold. In all honesty, the beluga has a rather exotic aerodynamic shape and controlling it is no easy feat. And if the balance of the aircraft is suddenly off, it will be almost impossible to land it. A special person is responsible for correct placement of the cargo. Oh, and he flies together with it, evidently to feel a greater responsibility for the work he's done. We always try to use the aircraft to the utmost of its capabilities. My colleagues and I always calculate what the maximum load might be. It's a fascinating and very challenging job. The cost of a mistake here is our lives and tens of millions of euros. But I am proud to fly on this airplane, of which there are only six in the world. The Beluga spends at most an hour in the hangar unloading, a quick inspection of the aircraft, checking all systems, and its wings up and back. In Spain, the next tail of the next giant aircraft in line is already waiting for its turn. Curiously, the parts of the future aircraft that the Beluga brings here to the planet in Toulouse are carefully sheltered and even enclosed in a very thick fabric. The area of this little case here is hundreds of square meters, to protect the elements of the aircraft. There should not be a single scratch on them. 
Thanks to its impressive size, the Beluga can take on board 47 tons of cargo at a time. But because of this, its range of movement is very small. It's more reminiscent of the range of some light aircraft. This giant can fly only 1,700 kilometers. Still, for the distance from France to Spain, that will more than suffice. Now that all the components of the A380 have arrived in one place, all that remains is to assemble them. For the monster plane, Airbus had to build a monster hangar. The weight alone of the metal structures used to build this workshop is 34,000 tons. That's four times the weight of the Eiffel Tower. The width of the doors through which the planes roll in and out of the hangar is 90 meters, and there are eight of those doors. It comes as no surprise that this structure can be seen with the naked eye from space. In total, three aircraft are assembled in the assembly shop at the same time. In turn, the three main assembly slipways are set up here. When the fuselage parts take their place, the slipway, with a total weight of 1,200 tons, seems to envelop the future monster from all sides. The three sections of the giant aircraft fuselage, plus two more wings, are assembled on this slipway, like some kind of children's construction set. Added to all that, this monumental work takes only five days. Here, by the way, is the place where the two parts join. Note that one section slightly falls over the other, so they end up overlapping. Here they are fixed with clamps like this. The sections are drilled and fashioned with rivets like this. And there are 3,000 of them here. So, oddly enough, the place where the two parts of the fuselage join is one of the strongest and most durable places on this plane. Still, riveting different sections to each other isn't exactly rocket science. That being said, you do have to tinker with connecting and labeling all the electrical and computer systems. It is this incredibly painstaking and vital job that takes up most of the time. We have several hundred people working here. With such a workforce, of course, it is very difficult to control everything. Tens of thousands of rivets need to be fitted and thousands of wires soldered. But we've established a setup in which everyone does their own part of the job, and then an inspector comes and checks it all multiple times. How many times? Uh... How long does a plane spend here? Uh, four, maybe five days. Five days? Yes, yes. That's not long. I'd even say it's really fast. Oh, yeah. And in these five days, you connect all the sections together, install, and even connect all the internal systems, yeah? Yes, that's right. Incredible. This is a very stressful job. The longest we've held a plane here was seven days. But that only happened once. One of the trickiest operations is joining the wing consoles to the fuselage. They're moved to the desired position by crane beams, and then precise laser corrections are performed. Around 4,000 high-strength bolts are used to connect one wing to the fuselage. And that being said, fastening the sections is no easier. So that the worker, God forbid, does not mix up and suddenly drills holes in the wrong place, there are these templates here. They're simply applied to a certain part of the fuselage, secured, and then with a special gun like this one here, holes are made through the holes in the template into which rivets are then inserted. It turns out that there are tens of thousands of rivets in one place, and each one has its own place. What's more, there are also several thousand such templates on the assembly slip, and each one suits only a certain place on the aircraft body.
Nowadays, an A380 lands or takes off around the world every seven minutes. These giants transport more than a million people a month. The machine seems to be selling itself, buyers are lining up and leaving with a smile. But Airbus continues to test and implement more and more new systems on this aircraft. They can only be fully tested in the air, and that's why here at the plant, there's a special plane, a guinea pig aircraft, which tests all new engineering ideas on itself. To be honest, the inside of the test A380 bears little resemblance to a passenger one, but rather a submarine or flight control center. All these complex computer systems monitor 20,000 different parameters every second. Suffice to say, the total length of the cables that connect the servers is 200 kilometers. Now you can imagine what a headache it becomes for on-site engineers when the connection in at least one wire from this bundle here, for example, is torn, and he needs to check every single one to find the fault. When an aircraft needs to simulate a flight with passengers, it's loaded with water tanks weighing a total of several dozen tons. And by the way, these pilots still have parachutes. The crew of a regular passenger plane, contrary to popular belief, of course, does not have them. This test aircraft is simply vital. It did most of its job, of course, when the A380 was just about to go into production. At that time, everything on it was tested from avionics to determining noise and cabin temperature. But even today, we don't stand idle. Practically every day, we take to the air to test a new engine or a new system. The process of testing a new item on this aircraft to serial introduction usually takes years. Aviation is both a cutting edge and rather conservative industry. The cost of error is too high, so all ideas and materials are checked dozens of times. And this means that on those planes, now being assembled in the Airbus hangars, systems are being installed that were invented and tested several years ago. The final silhouette of our monster has already taken form on the main slipway. Now it is being retrofitted with various units and mechanisms. This device will control the flaps of the A380, raising and lowering them, and with their help, the plane itself either gains altitude or descends. On conventional aircraft, this mechanism is much smaller. However, this is not surprising. The area of the flaps alone is the same as the entire area of a wing on an AN24. Several teams are working in parallel on the assembly slipway. One is responsible for the tail, the other for the right wing, the third for the left, and so on. It's important that everyone keeps in time with their schedule. After all, just one sluggish group of four or five people could delay the delivery of the entire liner, and this spells colossal penalties. One of the most critical areas is the installation of the landing gear, which, by the way, contains Russian titanium. This is generally the only element of this huge aircraft where products from our industry are at least somehow used. But to be fair, this can be deemed as a very crucial unit element. It takes on a huge load when landing. And of course, titanium is one of the strongest metals on Earth, the only one capable of handling the task, provided that the wheels don't fail. A set of tires for the A380 consists of 22 huge wheels with a diameter of one and a half meters each. On top of that, they're so powerful and the pressure inside is so strong that you can't even believe that the sound is rubber, so it completely feels like wood or, I don't know, plastic. And yet the load on these wheels is so great that the footwear for our monster has to be changed periodically. And that means about once a year. The planes that are on the slipways have yet to be painted. 
After assembly is complete, in this slightly unpresentable form, they fly on their own from France to Germany, where they'll be given the final polish. The only detail that's already shimmering with all the airline colors is the tail. In fact, there's an online camera installed under the ceiling in the assembly shop. The customer of the aircraft can see the feet from it, and from the tail, he can determine which of the three aircraft is his and what state of readiness it's in. Once the aircraft is fully assembled, it needs to be fully checked to make sure everything is correct. Interestingly, this process takes the same amount of time as the assembly. It happens in this hangar, plus they also install the engines. As a result, about three, sometimes three and a half fully finished aircraft are rolled out from here per month. I mean on average, of course. That means only 35 to 40 monsters are assembled here per year, and the concern's order portfolio includes hundreds of aircraft. This is where we carry out our testing. Extensive checks are carried out over several weeks to ensure that the electrical and hydraulic systems, as well as moving aerodynamic surfaces, such as rudders and wing mechanization elements, are fully operational. A thorough and lengthy check is performed on all engine systems. A big plane needs a lot of thrust. And although the A380 can fly confidently even with one failed turbine, it's better not to cause a heart attack. The Air 380 has four hearts, giant engines each packing 70,000 horsepower. And each of them burns hundreds of liters of aviation kerosene in just one second. Interestingly, these turbines for the A380 can be made by two completely different firms competing with each other. The customer himself chooses which engine he needs, and any of them will fit here like a glove. At the same time, the A380 is the most economical aircraft in its category. It's the only long-haul airliner that consumes less than 3 liters of fuel to transport a passenger 100 kilometers. Compare it with the consumption of your car, and you'll understand that flying works out cheaper. Well, at least when it comes to fuel. After all checks are complete, the aircraft moves out of the workshop and onto the airfield to perform what's known as a pressurized cabin test. It's akin to pressure testing batteries in our homes, which utility workers carry out before the cold season sets in. During this operation, excess pressure is created in the cabin, which significantly exceeds the permissible value for operation, to identify the possible presence of leaks. If everything is fine, pilots are brought on board for the final test. Their task is to make the first test flight. In other words, to get this monster up on its wings. The A380 cockpit is almost the same as any other Airbus aircraft. The company specifically makes them the same so that pilots can more easily transfer their flying knowledge from one type of aircraft to another, but they made an exception for this monster. Overall, the set of instruments is the same, but the displays are almost one and a half times larger, as a big plane needs big monitors. Romantic French pilots claim the first flight for any A380 is like a first kiss. Unique, each one has their own, and it's always beautiful. After all, only from this moment on can this huge and complex airline be rightfully called an airplane. In the Frankfurt terminal, passengers are still waiting for their invitation to board. The calm, unabashed appearance of the A380 outside still leaves no doubt about its reliability. Meanwhile, inside the monster, tempers are flaring for real. During preparation for takeoff, you can't help but feel that onboard the plane is complete chaos. 
There's a huge number of people, stewards, technicians, maintenance personnel, moving around the plane at great speed and constantly doing something. Laying out pillows, checking food, installing new armrests, headrests, repairing seats. In fact, everyone here has their own job to do, and everything is like a well-oiled machine. It takes only one hour to prepare this giant airliner for departure. At the same time, the technicians outside are refilling the aircraft with water and fuel, charting the batteries, checking the landing gear and engines, and conducting an external inspection of the fuselage. While the plane is parked, its engines are switched off, so the air conditioning and heating systems aren't working. And that's why these air ducts here are connected to the plane, and hot air is pumped through them directly into the cabin. This is done so that when people get inside the plane, it will be warm, all for the comfort and convenience of the passengers. After the technicians give the green light, the captain comes aboard. This time, he personally checks all control systems again, verifies the route, and inputs the flight map into the onboard computer. You know, this is a really good plane, the best I've ever flown in. It intuitively feels the pilot, and should the pilot do something wrong, it will always highlight the issue. On top of that, it obeys a person without question, and the handling is surprisingly easy. Basically, comfort-wise, it's like a Mercedes, while it handles like a Ferrari. The time has arrived for the passengers on the Frankfurt-Los Angeles flight to begin boarding. Everything is strictly according to schedule. Three epic paths guide people onto the huge plane in a matter of minutes. Walking along the two decks of this giant, they don't know that there are tens of thousands of wires under their feet. Behind the ergonomic upholstery are concealed a multitude of cables and pipes. And when they sit down in an economy class seat, they don't pause to think about the cost of this machine being several hundred million euros. Anyway, all that doesn't matter now. The main thing is that this airliner will lift them into the air in just a few minutes' time. <laughs> 